Well, hi, everyone. We have a good group today. Um, I'm, my name is Kevin McCarran. I am the chairman of the um, Grants Committee. I'm also the vice president of the Alumni Association Board of Directors. So welcome. Um, this is one of my favorite things that I do. This and graduation, it's nothing but a celebration. And giving away people's money is a fun thing. <laughs> so, and we did it here very successfully. Um, so we have two cycles each year, fall semester and spring semester. And during those times, we give out somewhere around $20,000. So it's, it's a good amount of money. This process, when we decide on all the applications we collect together, there are about eight of us that do this. Uh, myself, um, Allison Castellano who is uh, the immediate past chair and the current president of the Alumni Association Board of Directors. Um, there's Danielle Bailey, Christine Galinsky, Crystal Kolsnick. Good job, uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, Matt uh, LaCoyle, Amy Lewis, and Austin Provost. Um, and then Alira serves as our staff liaison. Um, so we have five presentations to go through tonight. And I think they, they're five minute presentations with about five minutes for Q&A. Um, and we're, we're fascinated to hear what, what happens. We were, you know, when we went through these applications, we were thoroughly impressed with all the things that were going on. So we're really eager to hear from you. So we have First Robotics Club. We have Success First, Society of Women Engineers, Title IX Education, and Alternate Spring Break. So without further ado, First Robotics? Yes. OK. So it should just advance. Uh, hi, all. My name is Ashley Smith. I am a senior here at Western New England studying industrial engineering. I have been working with the Robotics Club since I started it uh, two, three years ago now, which is um, so a little bit about FIRST Robotics, um, and I realized I didn't put in a slide, a slide uh, about FIRST itself. Uh, FIRST stands for for Inspiration and Recognition of Science and Technology. It's a global organization that has programs for uh, different age groups from K through 12. Uh, primarily the club works with the FIRST LEGO League, which is for grades 4 through 8, and the first robotics competition, which is for grades 9 through 12. So what we specifically use the grant money for was towards the first LEGO League. So these are, like I said, uh, grades 4 through 8. Uh, so these are usually teams of 10 comprised of 9 to 16 year old students who get a challenge in early September and then they have to come up with a solution to this challenge by building a Lego robot. So uh, this year, their challenge was City Shaper. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute. And what we did was we were able to bring 27 of these local teams from Massachusetts. I know you can't really read that, but that's a list of all the teams that we had come out to Western New England to compete, show off their projects, and show what they were able to come up with. So we held a competition here on campus, the FL Competition Agawam Qualifier, which was working with a local group as well who's been doing FIRST for years much longer than we have. And we held it all day in the HLC on December 7th. Uh, it went pretty well um, for a little bit of an idea of what these kids are doing. This is actually a picture of the field that the kids work on. It's about, I'd say, uh, four or five four by eight table size or so. Uh, so it's a pretty large scale table that they're working on. Um, I believe I did include some pictures from this year's competition. So we had around 500, 600 people come up for the competition. We had three tables set up where multiple teams were able to compete simultaneously. This isn't from this year, but these are better pictures. <laughs> uh, we actually held the competition last year as well, so this is the second year we're doing it. And it's a big success because these kids are able to come up with interesting solutions to these problems that they're faced with to compete on the tables and to uh, a number of different problems that are faced with them. But they also have to come up with a project as well. And part of that, too, is that they have to get up and present in front of adults who are in the field 
judging their projects and their teamwork and their ability to work throughout the season. So it's a lot of skill building for these younger students so that as they get older, they'll be more prepared for life ahead and hopefully want to stick with STEM and of itself. A couple of the other things that we do with some of these teams, just to give a little bit of a, an idea, we actually started two teams at this level at Duggan Middle School across the street. Uh, they are able to compete every year. We're very proud of what they can do because they're just really excited about it, which is what's fun. Uh, but we also have a lot of work with the FRC, which is what I also wanted to kind of bring up as well, um, just for everyone to know. This event, which we held in the HLC, takes up maybe about half the gym, but later this coming March, we'll be hosting a second competition for those high schooler students, which will take up the entire gym, uh, take three days, and about 2,000 people will be coming to campus uh, for the entirety of it. So if anyone is interested to see our next event, it'll be on March 20th to the 22nd, and this one is made with robots that are about 120 pounds and play on a basketball size court. I, that's actually a robot that I built my senior year of high school with my team. Um, so it's, it's a lot of fun to be a part of this program. And as someone who's been through it for four years myself, it's definitely the reason I did engineering. So to be able to bring this to the Springfield community more so, and to be able to engage these local students in it is really great. Uh, plus, it gives them something else to look at Western New England for. I know that was something I was looking at when I was going around to different schools, and we actually have a $1,000 scholarship now here at the school uh, because of the program we've built up. Great. So, I think that is everything I could possibly <laughs> say. Does anyone have any questions for me? If you're actually available to go see this, this is really, yeah. really interesting stuff. And it becomes like a, one of those World Wrestling Federation kinds of things. With <laughs> over the top. Exciting. It takes uh, six robots on the field, three people per each team. The, the FL kids, that's, that's a very nice day to go out and hang out with them and see what they were able to do. But the, the FRC one, the high school level, that's like a sports match. It's mm. insane, the energy <laughs> in that room. Yes. Is this open to public? Uh, the public? And yeah, absolutely. Is this maybe you just, you just show up? Or yeah, you just have to... stroll on in. Uh, Saturday is probably the best day to do it because that's when we're in those kind of qualification matches. Uh, but then on Sunday, we'll be moving into the elimination matches where teams will be able to kind of pick their alliance partners and then move on to see who wins the competition in its entirety. Can I add something? It's kind of a pseudo-program here for that. We started at about three years ago, and it's yeah. only because of, of Ashley and another student that used to be here, David Greenside, they grew up in first and they brought first to us and they said, can we do this? Sure, <laughs> tell us what to do, we don't know. And um, so they started the student club and then from the student club, and then you're able to meet with some of the people that are involved, like the FLL, the Ag, the reason it's called the Agawam Qualifier is because it was held over at the high school in Agawam for 20 years. Um, and then because we had this student support, because we had kind of a, a, an active program going here, they were able to then bring it over here. And it's not easy. You can't just decide to have one of these competitions. And, it, and this year, for the bigger competition, the FRC, there was some kerfuffle because they have 12 competitions for the Northeast, and they had 13 schools. Who's going to get cut? And, and so it's such a exposure plus for us because we're going to have 2,000 high school kids and their parents on our campus for two days. Um, from and, six different states, too. We've got students coming from Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Maine. I knew them all when I practiced this. <laughs> um, all from the Northeast, which is really great because this is also a global organization. So the fact that we have so many teams right in this area is really nice. And so the... Um, um, uh, part of the reason we're not kicked out of the system um, is because the, 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 what we offered them last year was um, so robust. It was kind of a no-brainer. There's other schools where the school's not quite as far behind them. They don't support as much um, kind of the infrastructure, the security, the parking, things like that. So just any kind of support that we can get for this internally, it's a giant plus for the university. I went to maybe 15 or 16 of these competitions uh, to compete myself when I was in high school. 
And it is very difficult to host one of these. I didn't had no idea back then, but some of the locations that we were in were not the most ideal. And not to toot our horn here, but we have a great location for it and a really great team behind it to make sure that it happens as well as possible. It's a lot of fun. And it's just, it's really great for the community too, because people coming out and seeing this and getting involved in STEM is just so important. Are you a senior? I am a senior. I have an extra semester to go because I wasn't quite sure which engineering field I wanted to go into. But Do you have any thoughts on how do you sustain it after you're gone? That is a very good question because this is a lot of work. And I have a couple of students on my team who I work with closely that, again, went through this program because once you're in, you can't get out. <laughs> uh, but I'm hoping that we can build up a base of students and faculty in this university who will continue to support the program after I leave because I would be really sad if it fell apart. I had a friend tell me sophomore year when I told her I was going to do this and she's like, you're not going to get a competition on campus this And now we're about to host our fourth. So I'd love to see it continue forward. Great. All, thank you. Well done. So next we have success first. Oh, and actually, you know what? Before I move forward, did anybody on the phone have any questions for Ashley? Well, very impressive. Very impressive. Awesome presentation. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all. <laughs> well, hello, I'm Sophia. Uh, I work here in the Academic Success Center, and I started Success First about four years ago. Um, I have one of our first cohort members here with me. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves. Well, I'm Nick. Um, I'm senior um, finance major. My name is Caitlin. I'm a junior here. I'm a dual major in forensic biology and general chemistry. And so uh, we had a graduate assistant in our office who was doing a little bit of research on first generation population. So what I was seeing is that a big portion of our population, a third plus, is first generation. And so being a first generation student myself, I, it was a passion project for me. It was something that I had wanted to do and bring here on campus is to bring some, some type of support here for our first generation student population. As a first gen student, a mentor, was so key for me and it's what kept me here it's what kept me going it's what got me to earning my degree of the program that i wanted to incorporate so some of the things that we do within the program is we have one-on-one -on -one mentoring we do workshops on our workshops i'll talk about in a second um we try and do group outings <laughs> um, we do the best that we can so sometimes those are things that are done on campus that are free and so I'll say, all right, let's take our group and let's go and do painting. We've done painting, we've gone bowling, um, we've gone down to MGM, um, we've gone up to eat and things like that to start really building that sense of community amongst our first generation population. Um, so each year students are invited um, as, as soon as open house actually, we're letting students know that this is a program that we have here on campus for them and that there's somebody here to support them throughout their journey. Um, then again at SOAR, we're reinforcing that, we're meeting with um, And then when they come here, everyone is invited. I send out emails. Um, we do personalized phone calls, thanks to my leadership team members, um, and things like that. We go into the student activities to really try and build a good cohort. Um, we've had ranges, so some cohorts are pretty small. We've had, I think last year was our smallest cohort with about 10. But we've had, I think Caitlin's was close to maybe 40-ish. It was huge. It was a big one. And then um, Nick's was about 20. And so this year, uh, I think we have about 20 as well. Um, and so uh, another part of that is like bringing career and start thinking about um, is, is the major that you picked at eight years old, 18 years old, the major that you're, you're really wanting to do is uh, and, and really trying to explore that. We also have different network opportunities and um, in the past, we have been able to award a bookstore voucher for books and supplies for our students. So some of the um, workshops that we do do is uh, financial aid tends to be a really big hit, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
So we bring some money in from uh, financial aid, but not only to talk about financial aid, but money management and what that means. And um, it's it's always always one of the workshops that everyone has a lot of questions and really give good feedback about. Um, another, like I said, we bring the Career Center in. I like to do a piece on exploring your why, because if you understand your why, then it helps give you purpose and drive, right? And so we do a little bit of that at uh, first in identity, um, anything that we feel and deem appropriate and necessary for these students. Um, again, mentorship is a, a big part of that. I, I was actually Nick's mentor, um, and Caitlin can talk about her mentor in a second. But we also do those study skills, like how to be a good student, um, time management, what is going to help me to be successful while I'm here, um, getting involved. All of those pieces are so important, and so we instill that into the students right from the start. So with the alumni support, we really are making strides. So these are just some of the things that we've done. We've gone on a conference, um, to a first-gen conference. I was able to bring a graduate assistant as well as some of the um, leadership team members. Um, again, I have started last, last, some, last year. We started National First Gen Day. November 8th is National First Gen Day. So you, you will see us out in the Campus Center or outside by the gazebo every November 8th going forward. Um, and with the alumni support, we have been able to do that. So we've, we're bringing awareness. Um, we've, we've purchased pins as they say on first gen to so bring that pride back to campus. Um, again, 40% this year are freshmen class for first gen. It's a big portion of our students. Um, so, right, numbers. So I don't know if you can see this, <laughs> but these are important. Um, so our first, our first year attrition rate, if you can see, um, these are first-gen students only. Um, the red is the students who did not participate, and the orange are the students who participate. And you can see the drastic numbers there. Um, and that continues on to the second year, um, and then the third year as well. So we only have, obviously, so much data because Nick is the first class. So he'll be the first graduating class who have, has participated in this program. Um, so, the, you know, from 11% of Students in his cohort, we lost compared to the 29% in their first year. Um, that's a that's a huge difference, and so we're doing something, and I want to continue to do that. And again, we would not be able to do that and keep hold and 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 keep doing this program for our students without the alumni support. Um, so I just want to have them talk a little bit about why they decided to join and what kept them here with us a, a little bit. So one of the things that kept me here was Sophia. She kept bugging me. I was like, oh, you should come join the leadership team. And then from there, also, I met my mentor. I had Adrian Garcia Sega, who's one of the forensics professors here. And it was interesting and nice to know that there was a professor that I was having for my classes that was also first gen and was able to share his experiences with me and like things that he did that helped him and just having that extra support that I could go to. And even in class after class, I could go to I was like, oh, I'm having this problem. Can you help me out? And I didn't have to go to my faculty advisor, and it was just a little bit more convenient. I also really enjoyed the fact that we did the financial aid session because I have no idea what I'm doing since I'm first gen. And so that was a big help to know what's going on and like what I'm exactly getting myself into, <laughs> signing all these loans and everything. So that was a big help and whatnot. Um, so I started, I joined the program because... I was actually in between classes. I got a phone call from the GA at the time, Sophia had, and he was like, "Come to this program. We're having an info session." I was like, "Okay, I'll go. Just stop bugging me." <laughs> <laughs> so I went. I actually brought along a friend, yes. um, Jill Mari. She was um, on the leadership team. Um, so we went there together because we're both first gen. And then so I liked the information that Sophia. Um, provided so I continued on with the um, program and through my first year I was like okay I really like it it's teaching me all these new resources on campus because I am a commuter so I just go to class and go home but with the program it taught me like where's the math center where's the career center and I utilized those resources so after my freshman year I was like I want to do more with the program I want to become go on the go on to with the um, leadership team because I want to help people who are in my position 
And I don't want like them to just like, okay. But so I continue here onto the leadership team. So I told him he had no choice. He yeah. had <laughs> and then Sophia as a mentor was awesome because she just I feel like I went to her more than my advisor. Cause she had the answers. <laughs> Um, I paid him to say that. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> no, but um, I, you know, this, this is going to be our first graduating class, and it's kind of like I feel like these are my babies, and I'm going to be up there. I told them I'm going to be screaming, even though they tell us not to clap. I'm going to be clapping because I'm super excited um, that I'm following them through this uh, through this journey, and I'm, I'm I'm able to be a part of that with them. Um, so. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. <laughs> and the program does create a sense of community because mm -hmm. we're all there every, not every Tuesday, but every other Tuesday. You're with the same people as freshmen. Um, it's not like you're in this class and then you go to a different class and it's whole different people. So every other Tuesday you come in and you're with the same people so you create that sense of community with each other. Plus, you're building connections with the leadership team. So I know my best friend is in that. She's also on the leadership team. And through there, I've built connections with people that she knows and kind of broadened my horizon instead of just knowing some of the science professors. I'm getting to know a little bit more of the people that she interacts with. So it's kind of nice to see and get to know a little and bit you, more. And how did you meet Annette? She was success first. <laughs> <laughs> and she was also, other than Sophia, she was also one of the ones that kept bugging me to apply for leadership team. And so I. He's not leaving either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I couldn't quite see the statistics. So there's there's two groups. There's the people that are in the program. Yeah. And people are not. So you don't really know. Nobody's graduated yet. So you don't. No, you we don't numbers. have a we don't have a graduation rate yet. We right. actually there was one uh, one student from. Yeah, but you do have a number for like you know people come in and then they're seniors like of the cohort. What percentage? It's of the, I'm sorry. Like of the cohort that are in the program, yes. have made it to seniors. Yes. It's bigger this, than the percentage of the people who are not in the cohort. Yeah. So our third our third year attrition rate for his 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 group, um, it was 22 percent compared to 36 percent of the students who didn't participate. Can you make it compulsory? Like just all. I don't have the money. <laughs> um, I, I, my, I really do my best. Obviously with students, right, we try to provide them food. How do you get students to do something? You bring food, right? Um, so Kathy, who is our sophomore, um, she had a doctor's appointment, but she was going to be here. And she always says, I went because there was pizza, right? She's a commuter. She didn't have a meal plan. She, we said pizza. She came. Um, but she always says that she stayed because she realized what she was getting out of the program, right? Um, yeah, that was actually my question for the students. What activities were the most engaging that got kids to come to your meetings? I know our financial aid sessions tend to be bigger because everyone wants to understand what they're getting into. Mm -hmm. And I know as a first gen, like you don't have the support at home necessarily of people who have already gone through it. So you're kind of in the treading water as you're trying to go through it. So I know that one tends to be our biggest one. Plus, we do a lot of icebreakers, which are a ton of fun because it gets your energy going and you get to meet more people. We did a paint night, which was really fun because, and you know, we had after being with better. That <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did. How many mentors do you have? Um, so it depends team? every year. So last year's cohort, I was a mentor for everyone, obviously because it was a smaller cohort. Um, and we this year we had a lot of um, we had probably about ten or twelve mentors, and I it, I went to a meeting and I said, hey, this is our program. Would you like to mentor a student? You know, um, and so I got a lot of interest there, and I was I was able to connect with a lot of people who wanted to be mentors. So I try to I try to connect them on some level, like major or like a similar um, area that they grew up in, or something like that, to try and build that connection right there. We do do a mentor meet and greet. We do some activities and stuff, and so usually during that uh, mentor meet and greet. Um, the students will either email me and say, I really would like this person, or the mentor will say, you know, this person, we made a really good connection. Any other questions? Any questions on the phone? Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Awesome.
Awesome. All right. So next we have the Society of Women Engineers. And just so you all know, I'm going to send the slides out afterwards, too. So if there's stuff you can't see, you can review it at that point. <laughs> We are the society, of, we are here representing the Society of Women Engineers, um, part of the group that went to the national conference in November. I'm Lindsay Greenleaf, I'm a senior electrical engineering major. I'm Rylan Abramson, I'm a senior integrated liberal studies major. Uh, I'm Kimmy Popowitz, I'm a senior biomedical engineering major. And I'm Andy Kuzala, I'm the SWE advisor, so I'm in biomedical <laughs> engineering. So the conference that we went to was the um, was We19. It's the world's largest conference for women engineers. Um, people come from all over the world to go to this conference. There's thousands of people spread across multiple buildings at the Anaheim Convention Center. Um, there were a ton of things to do at this conference. Um, there were presentations and lectures covering a huge variety of topics, including um, technical topics, um, outreach programming, how to network, um, women engineers in industry, and uh, there's also talked a lot about um, engineering at Disney, because it, it was, happened to be right near Disneyland, uh, <laughs> so there were a lot of Disney engineers there. Um, we also had the opportunity to attend a career fair, uh, network with others at a variety of different social events, there were volunteer opportunities. And uh, there were a couple different keynotes that we were able to attend on the future of technology and engineering. Mm -hmm. One of the big things that was provided to us through this conference was the chance uh, we were learn able to learn about networking through some of those breakout sessions. Um, they'd have little hour presentations about different topics to do with networking. Um, we also got to network. We ran into a couple of WME alumni there, and we got to talk to them, um, which was really cool, and SWE professionals. They had hospitality suites. A lot of the companies one night um, had hospitality suites. So if you were interested in those companies, you could go to those. Um, all of our name tags, if you had a LinkedIn account that was linked to your SWE um, account, you could scan something on their tag that would automatically connect you on LinkedIn so that you could keep these connections going. Um, and we also had the opportunity to attend a very large career fair where they were doing interviews on the spot, and I was fortunate enough from to get one of those interviews and to get a job offer from that. So, <laughs> what's the job? Um, it's working at the Aberdeen Test. Uh, I focused a lot of what I was there for on outreach. Um, so, being able to be at this conference, we were able to see what different volunteer opportunities were at conference and I actually spent um, a few hours volunteering at this conference and seeing how that how the different panels and things are run. Um, they also had a big community outreach event with local high school students, well, high school and middle school girls to get them more engaged in STEM. Um, and there were also different panels focused on community outreach activities and how to bring those into your own communities. Um, so the last thing that we learned a lot about was just knowledge for what we can bring back to make our underclassmen better because although we did bring six people from our university to the conference, we were all graduating seniors this year. So the big thing that um, we brought back was not only knowledge for ourselves, but how do we teach this knowledge to the next group going. So this was the first conference that, um, national conference that our school had actually sent members to. Um, so by doing that, we learned how the conference worked, what the schedule looked like. So this year we were like, you know, if we miss the first day, it's probably not that big a deal. We'll come in and we'll be there for the rest of the weekend. Um, and by doing that, we learned that that was not the right choice and that we do need to go to the first day of the conference because uh, we missed out on some great talks that were going on, some great keynotes. Um, and a lot of the career fair had uh, more opportunities for interviews on that first day where you met, you talked to them on that first day of the career fair and then on the second day they were actually running the interviews um, so it was harder for some people to get to that interview point um, at the career fair uh, another big topic that they talked about um, in some of the panels was being mentored 
um, and not only mentoring underclassmen um, while still in school, but how to be mentored for when you start going into the industry um, and transitioning from being that mentor for underclassmen here on campus to turning into the mentor and how to find your first mentor when you're out in the industry, um, where to look, who to look for, and what kind of connections you need to have with them. Um, and then also we learned more about just what being a SWE member gives you the opportunity to. So if you pay for that full um, membership fee to be able to be on the national website, what kind of opportunities it leads you to, what kind of connections there are in the field outside of college. And then there's a full career center opportunity section of their website that you gain access to when you become a full member and how to utilize that to be able to get those connections to get um, the interviews for your first jobs. Um, so what does the future of SWE look like on our campus now that we've come to this? Uh, so the big thing that our first project that we do is we're actually having an ice cream social um, and networking event on February 10th at 7 p.m., which you all, if you would like, are welcome to come. We do have the local SWE Hartford chapter is who we are a part of. Um, so they bring their professionals to come and talk to us. Last year we did like a dinner um, with some what we called like speed dating uh, talk around groups to be able to go to. And this year we are doing an ice cream social with it instead. Um, the keynote speaker that we all learned a lot from that was super inspiring um, and just like what are the amazing things about being a female engineer? What are some of the downfalls that everybody faces? How to pick yourself up from them? What it's like having a rough day and how to just work through it because everybody has them. Um, and this was done by Rachel Hunter, who's the Disney Senior Vice President of International Facilities, Operations Services, and Worldwide Safety and Health and Engineering. Sorry, it's a really long title that she had. It is a, it is a really long title. Um, and I, I remember showing this to my mom because I like loved this keynote so much. Um, my favorite thing that she said is she tells a story about when uh, she was having a really rough day and she had a, a co-worker that was like, you know what, let's go, let's get in my car. Um, and they drove to the back of Space Mountain. Um, road Space Mountain, they got off, and she's like, why did we just do that? It's like, well, when life's a roller coaster, sometimes you need to ride a roller coaster. Aww. And, and like, one, of the, really yeah. important. <laughs> <laughs> one of the big benefits, too, is they actually recorded the full keynote that she gave. Yes. So we are planning on getting that video and showing it to our membership at one of our meetings this semester to help inspire them a little bit um, so that they can see what we learned. Um, we also took time, because we all went to different panels, different sessions, we tried to make it a point that all six of us were not in the same room because there were so many things going on. So we can all bring something back and teach back to the younger students that weren't there of the topics that we learned about. Um, and then, again, a big thing that we learned about, because we're hoping that based off of people in the future, um, so that every year we can start having people go to this national conference, so just learning how to navigate the conference, how to navigate the conference app to know where you're going and how the schedule works. Because you open it up and there's like 6,000 things to go to and just navigating and learning like which ways to go, which are the things that are going to be most beneficial or like where there's this little title that says professional next to it means that means you should be a professional before you go to that because you're not going to get anything. It's going to be gibberish to you when you get there. Um, so just learning those things of just how to navigate the conference in itself will be something we can pass on when the new group gets connected uh, of who's going to go when they get picked. We can give that to them. Um, so we would like to just thank the Alumni Association and the Provost Office and then just our sweet fundraising that we did. And that was the only way that we were able to get this trip um, fully sponsored for us to be able to go. So if you have any questions. I have one. Um, outside of some of the networking stuff that you want to bring back, because networking and mentoring is really important, what like pieces of advice or like knowledge bases do you want to bring back to those women engineering students on campus? So I focus a lot on outreach because I am yeah. the community outreach chair for SWE. Mm -hmm. um, so I went to a panel that was focusing on how to gamify learning, and I was going to bring that back in a way that um, we do several outreach events on campus throughout the year that we that we bring in outside people um, to get them more interested in STEM. So being able to incorporate what I learned from those panels to create my own activities and share those with other SWE members and so they can learn how to create them. Because I am a senior. I need
bring somebody else. <laughs> One of the big things I learned um, from this was there was a big section I went to and it was like, it was called Get Grit. So I was like, this could be interesting. Let's see what this is. And it was learning about why being considered that you have grit and what grit means and why um, being able to push forward through the hard days and learning through failure and just having the grit to get up and keep going is important in the industry. Um, whether, and it's not even just in industry, whether it's research or in academia, they were talking with the professor side of things that just having the grit to keep going and not having that adjective and somebody's just being like, oh, you've got grit and thinking that's like a negative thing, but really turning that around and looking at the positive aspect of that and how that's actually a compliment um, to be considered to have grit rather than um, a negative thing where it's just like, oh, you're just pushing people around all the time. How many members do you guys have? Um, our meetings this year have been larger than years past, which is very exciting. Yeah. <laughs> We've had about, um, I would say 15-ish 15, 15 at yeah. our meetings, um, give or take. Some meetings we have more people, some meetings we have less. Um, last night we had 30 people signed up. Yeah, we had a large group sign up. Sign up. Um, last night we had about 12, we did minute to minute games, just an activity to get everybody gets to know each other better and connect with the, for us as upperclassmen, connect with underclassmen so that we can be a resource to them. Is the ice cream social designed to try and get more membership? Uh, the ice cream social is more working with how to get the internships and how to get jobs and okay. build connections. Um, but also just getting the connection for underclassmen to learn um, why to continue with engineering and why being a female engineer is important. But I was very interested in your talk previously because the next steps for SWE, especially for me as the faculty advisor, is increasing recruitment, getting them to stay within the club, creating opportunities for them to network and to get to know each other, to create community. Those are all challenging, especially when you're trying to navigate difficult schedules. And, right. and so whatever we can do, if you guys have suggestions, we would love any feedback we can in terms of engaging these guys and keeping them at the meetings and participating. Do you have any alumni that you connect with that were in the club previously? Um, I personally connected with an alumni at the conference that I didn't know was going to be there. Um, she was actually one of my lab TAs when I was a sophomore here. Um, so that was really cool and now I can contact her whenever I have questions. Um, another thing with Ice Cream Social is bringing in those sweet Hartford professionals is they serve as a contact that we can all contact them in the future if we ever have questions about did you ever face this or how should I go about doing this um, and showing us that SWE extends beyond here at the university. It's an organization that you can be a part of for your life. We've also brought in alumni before to, to do talks on um, from early the career. Yeah, early career talks. And we started a LinkedIn page. Mm -hmm. We should get That's all awesome. of our alumni. Yeah. That. Great. <laughs> Any questions on the phone? No question. Congratulations on the job offer. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone. So, Title IX is next. So, you know, arrow. Arrow. Yes. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Beth Hill. I'm the Senior Associate Director of Residence Life here at Western New England University. And I am also the Title IX educator. Back in 2011, something came out, lovely document called the Dear Colleague Letter. And it started talking about Title IX that was established in 1972 about gender equality at universities. What also came out of it, though, was that anything in terms of bias, in terms of gender bias, including sexual assault, sexual harassment, and misconduct, um, came out from that and they're like, hey, wait a minute, we need to do more on this. We can't discriminate against that. But we also need to do education. So guess what? I'm here. Um, so here is your education. Um, so when it comes to this, however, everybody's like, mm, we're going to talk about sex. What does that mean? How are we going to talk about sexual assault? How are we going to talk about sexual harassment and that type of thing? So one of the big things that we wanted to get across was the whole message of consent and what that means on college campuses. Um, and that was big, one of the biggest factors in working with students um, that were survivors of sexual assault was the whole concept of consent, that you need permission to touch my stuff. 
most valuable thing is yourself, which is your stuff. So we really focus on that. So this is one of the thanks to the um, yeah, um, Spice Girls. Girls. Thank you. <laughs> and I couldn't get the song out of my head after a while, so it was really kind of fun. Um, one of the other things that we did, though, too, is we really want to keep it up to date and, 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 and current. So what we I created a fake Facebook page, but it really focused on a lot of things that um, Taylor Swift was facing when she went through her entire uh, entire sexual assault and sexual misconduct case in the courts. And so this really grabbed some of the attention from the students. In addition, I think that one group that um, is always overlooked um, it tends to be those male students that may be sexually assaulted, sexual misconduct. Um, so we really tailor our um, publicity and education to all genders, all gender identities. Um, and so I think that that's really, really important because we have gender non-binary students and we have uh, transgender students on campus. And those are the populations that unfortunately are the ones that are becoming more and more victimized on college campuses. So we are focusing on more of the male, but not losing sight of female, but also our trans and our gender non-binary um, students. We also like to use our resources, and I'm sorry for how small this is, but one of the things that we did is um, public safety uh, came up with the RAVE app a couple of years ago. And I think some students thought, well, I really don't need this. It's going to be obnoxious. It's just going to send me messages I don't want to hear. But there's so many benefits to the RAVE app. There's, you can file anonymous complaints on there. It is like something that sends right to public safety so that if there is an emergency, they can spot. So here was we, we did a secret shopper. And so I had students going around and saying, hey, do you have your, uh, the Rave app on your phone? And if the student said yes, they would ask, okay, can you show it to me on your phone? And they'd get a $5 Dunkin' Donuts gift card. If they didn't, they were like, ah, I love it. Um, <laughs> and they downloaded it pretty darn quick after that. They said, can you come back? Um, no, but we got more and more of our students to get involved. So I like the secret um, shopper campaign. I think the other thing is, is that there's so many different mediums that we can do in terms of educating our students. And so we started off with some movies with the first year program, The Hunting Ground, and then it happened here. And last year we had the honor of, um, thanks to the Alumni Association, showing on the basis of sex. And that was shown in the Campus Center on a couple of, um, at a couple of showings during the day. And this was open to all of the campus population, including our law students, pharmacy students, and undergrads. And we did have law students show up. I think it was the whole Ruth Bader Ginsburg um, piece of it that they wanted to hear more information about. But it was just a great way to get some messages across through a different medium. Um, when it comes to Title IX education, we don't have a budget. And that's where we turn to you folks. And so that's why I'm so greatly appreciative of this. And I get the letter saying you've been approved. And it's like, I just hit the jackpot. Um, so I do have very limited funds. Um, so a lot of this stuff is homegrown. You'll notice some of the things that um, are up there are some of the poster campaigns that we did about healthy relationships and yourself. Because a lot of times what we're figuring out is in issues of sexual assault and sexual misconduct, it comes about self-love and self-esteem and self-worth. So if we can build students up and not just focus on rape is bad, but how can we prevent it from a self-care standpoint? So at the bottom left, you'll see the yellow. We gave out scarves um, that I handmade that said, wrap yourself in respect. So they were really nice and, and um, the students really, really enjoyed those. So that's just some of our marketing campaigns that we've used. Um, the other thing is, like I said, focusing on Healthy Relationships Week. And a couple of years away, uh, years ago, we did, actually two years ago, we did Puzzle. It's the bottom center. And basically, it was trivia. So we asked some quick questions. And then we also had the building blocks. Um, and it's a spin of Jenga that basically talked about different um, words to define relationships and what happens when that whole, um, those positive words come down and build down into um, fall apart. We use the Legos to talk about positive words. So what positive words are good to build that foundation for yourself as you go into a relationship? And then we also made friendship jars, which is on the left-hand side of the picture screen, where students could decorate them, put notes in them, and give them to their friends to show their love and appreciation. The other thing we did was the Pets Not People, or Pets Not Partners, excuse me. And so if you read this from an outsider, you can say, you know, 
I will kiss you whether you like it or not. Well, it's really cute because it's a puppy there and it's a kissing its owner, right? But let's take that statement and let's put it in the, um, in the form of a relationship. So when we're talking about partners, think about that in the terms of partners and the different impact that it has. So this was a more um, subtle advertising campaign that we did as well. Finally, one of the things that you folks really helped us with, which is amazing, is every year on the 9th of September, so 9-9, um, we do the Know Your Nines Day, where we have this huge festival out by the gazebo, and we have giveaways, and we have trivia, and we have popcorn, and we have um, just lots of fun stuff, I have to tell you. It really is a lot of fun stuff. We grab students as they come by. This year, we had about 168 students walk by. Um, and they were able to ask, we asked them trivia questions, and if they answered them right, they spun a wheel and they got a prize, anything from um, a t-shirt to a um, coffee mug to maybe a button or whatever that they wanted. Um, so this is something that we're going to keep alive every year. It's very, very fun. The other thing about this is, and it's wonderful, is that these t-shirts are made up with this logo. So with this logo, if you wear your t-shirt on the ninth of every month, if you go to Starbucks downstairs, Aramark has been so generous and has given a free cup of coffee for the first 20 people wearing their t-shirts. So we have a little bit of like subtle campaigns going on every ninth of every month. And so um, we really appreciate the support of, of Aramark. The one thing I really look for you folks to help us with are two big events in the spring <coughs> semester, and that is the Take Back the Night, where we can really focus on ending the silence and ending the violence on the campuses. Um, while at times there's minimal participation in this, I think it does bring out those people who really need to have their voice be heard and start taking the power back and, in the cur and, and establish that courage. The big, big one that we have is Denim Day. I love Denim Day. I love Denim Day. So basically, Denim Day was established from back in 1990 in Italy when an 18-year-old student was taking driving lessons from a 65-year-old um, male, and he sexually assaulted her. And when it went to court, um, the magistrate threw the case out because the 18-year-old was wearing tight jeans. So she had to have willingly participated because the jeans were so tight that they couldn't come off unless she gave consent. So. We take back the last Wednesday in April, and we have Denim Day. And it's a nationwide and international movement. And I'm really happy that we get to be able to do this. What we do is, once again, we go out to the gazebo, because it's so great out there. The students are constantly walking by. And we give them information about sexual assault, once again. Um, whether it be um, about what the definitions are, what they have for um, what their rights are, what Denim Day is about, why we are wearing denim. And we also do a photo campaign with that. Um, what we will do too out there is that we will give out prizes, as I said. So keeping in the spirit of a little bit of fun. Um, some of the questions that we have asked is, um, what word do you need to hear for consent? Would it be A, I'm sure, B, yes, C, maybe, or D, probably? What do you think the answer is? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Danielle, get every t-shirt. <laughs> um, we ask another one. More than blank million Americans participated in Denim Day 2011. And those of you at home, you can play along. Answer. <laughs> A is, I haven't changed. 3.3, um, 2.6 million, 2.0 million, or 6.5 million. How many people participated in Denim Day in 2011? 3.3, 2.6, 2.0, or 6.5? 6.5? No. 2.6. 3.3. Not 2.6, and not 3.3, 3. 3. so 2.0, yay! 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 And you get a t-shirt as well! Oh, look at that! Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> see, you come to the site, you present, you get a t-shirt anyways. Hey, this is great. Um, the students also walk away with a card that just talks about the story that I gave you a brief overview on in terms of why we, why we recognize Denim Day and why we are supporting it. Um, a couple years ago, we had poster campaign once again. I did the photography, <laughs> did the posters, but it's I wear denim because. And you, <clears throat> you'll notice that there's various constituents of our campus police up there. 
uh, our campus community up there, campus police, some of the faculty, some of the staff, and some of the students. So it's really a great way for everybody to get involved. And then finally, the recognition that we provide to those people across the United States and internationally regarding the support that we have for our students, those people that are impacted directly or indirectly by sexual assault, sexual misconduct is amazing. And I think that through social media, through Western New England University, through these programs, and because of the financial support of all of you, um, we're able to continue that education and continue to make a movement where hopefully we can reduce violence on campus and have a safer campus community for all. That's what I have. Any questions? Yes. I actually have a little story to share. Um, I don't know if I've actually ever told you this, Beth, but Beth is great. She gives the staff um, the shirts to wear. So on the ninth day of the month, we wear our shirts to show support. And at first, I was just like, yeah, I get to wear a t-shirt and jeans to work. This is exciting. But I had a student who was actually a survivor of sexual assault. And she came up to me and she said, seeing the staff wear those shirts means so much to me. And it makes me feel safe. And I was, I don't know if I ever shared that with you. But it was shared that with me. <laughs> and now I'm on the internet and I'm going to cry. I know. I'm going to cry too. <laughs> but again, you wouldn't, those shirts, you think, oh, they're just shirts. But they're not just shirts. shirts. It shows that we're a unified campus community. And it's... It's lovely. So thank you, and thank you to the Alumni Association. Other questions? Question? Oh, hi. No, sorry. Oh, of course. Um, <laughs> so one, I appreciate that um, you were cognizant of non-binary and, and the trans population, because I feel like that gets, I feel like a lot of the times we only think of cisgender female um, survivors. Um, is there any other part of Title IX, like the harassment, domestic violence, stalking, like those areas that like you touched upon and want to expand on, or things that you want to like, or is it more like directly assault awareness? It's not necessarily just the just, assault. Yeah. A lot of the cases that we have coming forward are a lot of the harassment, mm -hmm. um, or even the, the gender bias comments. And unfortunately, a lot of this we're finding happens in the classroom from faculty to students. And that's re resolved through our human resources office. So um, luckily, in some ways, I don't have to see that piece and I get to work just with our student population. But what I really try and focus on, and I think that we need to focus on, because uh, media is so heavy on the negativity of sexual assault, I think that it's more important to focus on the, positive the positivity of communication and healthy relationships um, and what that means. Um, in terms of just self-awareness, and so people understand where their surroundings are. Um, just a general awareness of what their rights are. I think people forget that this is mine, and I'm gonna give you permission to have some of this. And I think people sometimes really forget that piece. Um, so we try to make it a little bit fun, we try to make it a little bit lively, because sexual assault is a really crappy thing to have to talk about. Um, or sexual misconduct or any of it. So we really try and find more ways to talk about um, the positive yeah. side and how we can help ourselves to be better citizens. Okay? Any questions at home? <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. And last but certainly not least, we have the alternatives Sorry, guys. <laughs> I do that all the time. It's okay. <laughs> all right. All right. Okay. So knowing that we were going to be following Beth with all of her fun and <laughs> swag items, we also brought some things. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone can take one of these. These are our um, magnetic poetry. It has ASB, some great words on there that kind of describe the program along with CARE, which is our Community Action Rewards Everyone, our uh, on-campus volunteer service club. And for the members of the Alumni Association, we have a picture of our crew this year. And it has a little thank you on the back. So if anyone doesn't get one and would like one, you can come to my office if you're here on campus. Happy to do that. My name is Kristen McClintock. I am the Assistant Director of Student Volunteerism here. And I'll let these lovely ladies introduce themselves. Okay, um, my name is Michelle. I am currently a senior forensic biology major. 
I'm Chandel Pascual, and I'm a senior with the biology major as well. And we also have a scrapbook that I made for Alternate Fall Break because I was the team leader. So I'll pass it around. You guys can take a look at what we did on our adventures. Yes. <laughs> so I'm not very technologically savvy. Do you know how to advance the screen? Got it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> okay. So this is our team this year. For you, those of you who don't know, um, Alternative Break Program led initiative organization where um, students can participate in direct service um, in the community. So for alternative fall break, we had a team of 12 students and myself, uh, actually, sorry, 11 students and myself, and alternative fall break focuses on serving our immediate community. So we stay really close to home. Um, and the thing that's really interesting about alternative fall break is that we, it doesn't cost the students anything to participate. So as opposed to our alternative spring break trip, which happens over the spring break in March, um, and it generally costs about $800 because we tend to travel. So the fall break is something that students can apply for. Again, if they are accepted, it is paid for, again, by generous grants by individuals like yourself. So thank you. Um, let's see. The nice thing about this year, we had students of all different um, grade levels. So we had first year students, sophomores, juniors, and seniors, which is great. Typically, we don't see a lot of first-year students who apply. Um, our application process happens right at the beginning of September, so for a lot of those first-year students, they are hesitant to commit to something uh, that they don't really know much about. So this year, we actually had, we saw an increase of 28% of our applications, which is amazing because, for those of you who don't know, Alternative Fall Break has been on hiatus for two years. And we've had staff changes, budget cuts, and so this, grant by the Alumni Association and Dr. Jason Seacat also was what was what enabled us to start this program back up. So this was huge. And I knew it was going to be really exciting. Students have been asking about it since I started in this position. They said, when's alternative fall break coming back? And we had some naysayers in the campus community who said, I don't know if students are going to apply because it used to be part of our learning beyond the classroom requirement. So students could participate in this weekend of service and it would count for their graduation requirements. And I said, I don't think that's going to be the case. I've had a lot of students express interest. So again, last year, Shandell was on our alternative spring break team, and she was selected to be our team leader. She worked tirelessly over the summer. We were on the phone. She's from Hawaii, so we were <laughs> calling at all hours um, organizing this. And again, it was a huge success. So oh, before we get to that. <laughs> Um, one of the things that's a challenge with alternative fall break is because it happens in October. It's really hard to build that sense of community. We have a pretty unique group of students. They come from all different colleges and again, class years. So with alternative spring break, we have a whole semester to do team building. So build a kind of relationship within the team, but it's really, really quick. So Shondell did a great job. She decided that for our Friday night activity, our group kind of team building activity, we were going to go to an escape room, which, has anyone here done an escape room? Oh, yeah. Yeah. They are so great. <laughs> so we traveled to this escape room. We had an orientation before where people got to meet each other. But this was a chance for our team to get to know one another and to understand a little bit more about group dynamics. And that's one of the goals of Alternative Break. It's not only to come out to provide like service to the community, but to kind of build the community on our campus as well and to create that bond that might not happen otherwise. So. We did the escape room. Um, we thought we were doing really great. We thought we were like, oh, we're, we solved. We got the first room. We solved the, the puzzle. And then another secret door opened. We're like, oh, we're not even close to being done. We were all celebrating prematurely. But a lot of fun. And again, it was a great opportunity for the team. Would you guys agree? Yeah. Yeah? yeah it, was great. it was really fun. I'm going to let them talk more, I promise. <laughs> um, so yes, we were able to escape. It was kind of a high. So then Saturday, we were working with Habitat for Humanity. and. We got up really early, bright and early on Saturday morning. We drove to Holyoke, and we were able to work on a new construction house being built. And do you guys remember the story of the, the family? Yeah. So this home was being built for a refugee family from Africa. Oh. And they were currently, it was six people living in a one-bedroom apartment in Holyoke. It was substandard living. Um, and this family was just so motivated and so inspired. Um, that they have to work 500 hours on their Habitat house, each family. Um, they have to give that time to work on it. They had, at this point, already 
uh, dedicated over a thousand hours. So it was such a lovely story. We didn't get to meet the family, unfortunately. They had had a dedication ceremony the weekend before, and what we were doing is wrapping up. Um, they were scheduled to move in at the end of October, and it was really, really important for us to get in there and make sure that that house was complete because their lease was expiring, and if the house didn't get completed, they were gonna be homeless. So we got there, and we kind of, uh, we picked up what needed to happen. We worked with a great guy named Jim from the Habitat team who kind of guided us along. Um, so we did a little bit of everything. We have some pictures here. This team was amazing. There was nothing they couldn't do. They were picking up power tools and giant saws, and they just got to work. And it was really, really impressive. And as an advisor, it was wonderful. Fearlessness and the urgency in which these students worked because they knew that this, this was really, really important for this family to get in. And it wasn't like we were putting up walls. Sometimes the work we were doing was more finishing touches, but those were really important too because this was somebody's home. And so again, one of the goals of Alternative Health <coughs> it's building new relationships among the team members and people in the community, um, but also with the community itself. So we were in Holyoke, which as many of you know, is um, it's a struggling community. And to be there and to know that we're not only helping this family, but we were helping this community. And my favorite part of the entire entire time, and I think, I don't know, I, yeah. we were working and people who were walking by and driving by kept shouting out, thank you, you're doing great. Like the encouragement yeah. from the community was, yeah. oh, it was amazing. <laughs> and so to know that the whole neighborhood was appreciating what these students were doing and that they were lifting this community up and it was, it was wonderful. Um, one of the other goals too, and what we, alternative fall break incorporates a lot of reflection. Shondell did a great job as the team leader. We would work, we would get together, and then we come back as a group and we talk about why is this happening? How did this impact us? What did we learn today? And what are we gonna do going forward? It's a very short time, but it kind of changes us. And there are things and how one day of service can really change not just a family's life, but again, that entire community. So we wanna thank um, the Alumni Association again Without the support, we couldn't do this program. And personally, I see so much value in what we do. And the students, <laughs> I'm going to cry. They continue to impress me with just how diligent and how selfless they are and how much they're willing to give back. And again, I think seeing that increase of applications, they didn't get anything out of it. They didn't get credit. They sacrificed one of the short breaks they have during the fall semester to give back to people that they had never met before because it's important. And I think we can all agree, service is a huge component of Western New England. And these are the opportunities that really help the students give back and yeah, change, change the community for the better. So ladies, I've been talking, I get, I get carried <laughs> away. Do you guys have anything you wanna add? I'm sure the questions you guys uh, have for them. Yeah, so for me specifically, when I came here from Hawaii, I literally knew nobody. But one thing, one of my core values was volunteering. And I met Kristen through, well, my second year actually, I met Kristen. But I met her through like care and through volunteering. And like, I'm mostly an introverted person. So putting myself in amazing. And this unique group of people who share the same values as you. And we still talk to this day. We still get together, which is amazing. And this was my first leadership opportunity. So for Kristen to give me this opportunity was amazing. She earned it. I'll give it to her. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it was so interesting doing the process of making this trip because you learn about so many different nonprofits in the community and how they're trying to do just a little thing to help. And it's amazing to see it, like for us to ask them to help them and they're graciously letting us. And then we get to give back to that same community. And like, it's just a unique experience and like anybody who does it will tell you that it's one of the best things they'll ever experience. And like, that was one of my main goals was I wanna try and get the younger people to do it, like freshmen, sophomores. So that's why I'm like putting myself into this program. And now that we have Alternative Fall Break back, we're trying to expand on it and try to see if we can do more trips, hopefully in the future. I'd love to see an alternative winter break yeah. so that some of our athletes who can't participate in the fall or the spring have that opportunity to give back. Um, <laughs> um, so, I'm a senior this year and I wish I knew about this program a lot sooner because I definitely would have participated and that was my message when we met for our reflection to all the younger students like please do this again keep involved like tell your friends like have more people come because 
it was one of the best experiences that I've had on this campus so far. And it taught me a lot about me as a person and like Shandell, like you would like she said she's introverted. You would never say that. Like she was the best that we could have had. And she did everything so well and it just brings out the best in everybody. Mm -hmm. It really does. Um and you just like to impact somebody's life that you might never meet is okay. Like it's that's the best feeling that you can have. So it's inspired me, like I want to reach out and do my own volunteering like once I graduate at a hospice center. So um, we'll see how that goes, but it was a really great experience for me. So do we have any questions? No, okay. Thank you again, thank you. And thank you to the campus community too because there's a lot of support on this campus and whether it's coming to, you know, our receptions after it's saying, yay, like great job, or just supporting the students um, when they make that that jump and, and leap to do so um, and be a part of our program, it's it's wonderful. So thank you all very, very much. Right. Well, thank you all so much. You all did fantastic presenting, and it was so good to hear from you. And thank you to the Grants Committee for also being here and for doing this work. Um, Kevin, did you have anything you wanted to say before you conclude? The presentations just completely validate you know, the, the grants that we've been giving out, and just we're very proud of you and, and very thankful that you're around. So thank you very much. Are there any final questions before we all head out for the night? Anybody on the phone that didn't get to uh, say anything before? All right. Well, thank you all so much. Enjoy your evening. And please feel free to take food if you need something for the drive home or the walk home. <laughs> yeah.